Svatova paratova pina kingchit vastu jayate. Sadasat sadasadva pina kingchit vastu jayate. A thing, whatsoever it may be, is born neither of itself, nor of something else, nor of both together. Nothing whatsoever is born that already exists, does not exist, or both exists and does not exist. Alternate Translation Nothing whatsoever is born, either of itself or of another. Nothing is ever produced, whether it be being, non-being, or both being and non-being. There are six possible alternatives in the case of the birth of a thing. It is either born of itself, or of another, or both. That which is born is either existing, or non-existing, or both. This karika shows the absurdity of all these positions, and conclusively establishes the theory of absolute non-evolution. For this further reason, nothing whatsoever takes birth, since a thing that supposedly undergoes birth, najayate, is not born, svataha, of itself, parataha, of another, va, or of both. Nothing takes birth that is sat, existing, asat, non-existing, or satasat, existing and non-existing. That is to say, the three alternatives regarding the cause are denied. There is no possibility of birth for it in any way. To illustrate, as a jar does not come out of that very jar, so nothing that has not itself come into existence can be born svataha out of its own form by itself. Birth always means change. If a thing produces another thing, it cannot do so without a change in itself. If it undergoes a change, it ceases to be the thing itself. Therefore, a thing cannot be the cause of the same thing. A jar cannot be the cause of the very same jar. Nor does it take birth parataha from another as something different from that other just as a cloth is not born of a pot, or a cloth from another cloth. Similarly, a thing is not born both out of itself and another, just as a jar or a cloth is not born out of a jar and a cloth, for this involves a contradiction. For a cause cannot combine within it two contradictory aspects at the same time. Therefore, an object which is supposed to be born cannot be born from a cause which is both existing and non-existing. In other words, the three alternatives regarding the effect are also denied. Objection. Is not a jar produced from earth and a son born of a father? Answer. True, the ignorant have such notions and use such words as it exists, it takes birth, those very words and notions are examined by the discriminating people as to whether they are true or false, inasmuch as things called a jar, a sun, and so on, which are contents of words and notions, are found on examination to be reduced to mere words, as is declared in the Vedic text, all modifications are but names dependent on speech. Chandogya Upanishad 614 because, as discussed above, the birth of a son or the production of a jar cannot be proved. If a thing already exists, then because it already exists, it cannot pass into birth, like earth or a father. Birth, signifying a change, would indicate that the thing had been non-existent before it was born. This previous non-existence cannot be reconciled with the idea of its being ever-existent. If the sun or the jar be ever-existent, then they cannot be born from a father or clay. If a thing does not exist, like the horn of a hare, etc., then by the very fact of non-existence it cannot undergo birth. 
horns of a hare are ever non-existent. Hence, no birth can be predicated of them. If it is both existent and non-existent, then also it cannot take birth, as it is impossible to have a thing that is self-contradictory. Hence, it is established that nothing whatsoever is born. Namaste. So we don't need to read the rest of that, which just applies to the Buddhists, because we already know they're out to lunch. <laughs> no kidding. Bhikkhu Nyanananda is perhaps, or was perhaps, the greatest Buddhist scholar of the 21st. Yeah, 21st century, 20th and 21st century. But he himself told me that the light is going out in the sasana. In other words, the Buddhist society has deviated from the original teachings. And because of this, he also told me, if you're reading the suttas and you find something that disagrees with the Upanishads, it's probably interpolated. In other words, it was added later by people who didn't understand, who were politically motivated and so on. So we don't need to even, you know, they put themselves down. They defeat themselves by contradicting the Buddha. In fact, there's one uh, passage in the famous book by Buddha Ghosh, The Path of Perfection, where he quotes a discussion, an argument between himself and a Brahmana. But the Brahmana is expressing exactly the Buddha's position in the suttas. And he's arguing against it? You see, this is the nonsense going on in Buddhism. So they're not even a contender. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The Truth that is explained here is that from a logical point of view, from the point of view of discrimination, nothing is ever born. There is no such thing as a product because for a product to exist, it has to come out of a source. And by giving birth to a product in any way, that means the source would change, the cause would change. And by changing, it ceases to be whatever it was and becomes something else. So the cause cannot exist and the effect cannot exist because how can something take birth from a non-existent cause? You see, all these arguments prove what I've been saying for years, which is that you cannot prove the existence of the material world. Because if the universe is a product, it has to be created. That means it has to have a cause. And the only cause is Brahman, the only possible cause, the only thing pre-existing the universe. But Brahman never changes. So it's not possible for the universe to exist. It's maya. It does not exist. What is it then? Simply forms based on names. We distinguish between one thing and another. And because of time precedence, we say the first thing is the cause of the next thing. Uh, the father is the cause of the son. The clay is the cause of the pot. Well, that might be adequate for, you know, ordinary daily interactions and manipulation of objects and so on. But philosophically, it doesn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> As these shlokas prove. So what is the truth then? The truth is that this universe is simply imagination. It's simply a concoction. It's just Maya. It's, I don't know, a dream. 
a, a, an imagination, a speculation? You know, it's hard to put words on it because even a dream exists and is real in dream consciousness. And in waking consciousness, sensory consciousness, this world certainly appears to be real. We don't contest that. It appears to be real. But if it's real, why does it disappear when we go to sleep? Why doesn't it persist through all states of consciousness? Why are there different states of consciousness to begin with? It can only be explained rationally, logically, by the concept of upadis, that the unlimited, changeless Brahman becomes covered by some superimposition that makes it appear limited and changing, and thus the illusion of birth or creation of a product, cause and effect. So if cause and effect is only a phenomenon of the illusory state of Jagrat consciousness, that means it is confined to that state of consciousness alone. It is not present in other states of consciousness. For example, in dreams. In dreams, things just exist. They are the way they are. And there's no history to them. They simply pop into being when we enter Svapna consciousness and they exist for some time and then they change into other things and fade away and, you know, all kinds of weird stuff happens in dreams, right? Well, what to speak of deep sleep, sushupti consciousness, where there are no objects, nothing is happening, no perceptions at all. So when we experience sushupti in ordinary sleep, it's covered by ignorance. But when we experience it with awareness, it's called samadhi. So the very same thing can be ignorance or enlightenment, depending on whether we approach it with awareness. Lucid dreaming, for example, can give wonderful insights into the nature of the mind and one's own emotional and mental makeup. Because dreams are based on memory, things that we've experienced before. And then we experience them again as a way to digest their meaning, to comprehend them better. So this is the purpose of dreams and sleep. But we are to wake up we are to leave behind these various dreams, and I include uh, waking consciousness, huh? so-called waking consciousness, as a dream. Why? Because those names and forms are just as temporary, just as impermanent as a dream while asleep. The only difference is there is an apparent continuity between one day and the next, Whereas in dreams, you know, anything can happen. They're all disconnected. But that's not an indicator of reality because those things still disappear at night or whenever our consciousness changes. And the same is true of enlightenment, that when one becomes enlightened and reaches Turiya consciousness, one sees that all these things, these objects of perception, are dreams. Why? Because they are apparently different from Brahman. And yet, we know that nothing actually exists except Brahman. So how do we reconcile this? It's all Maya. It doesn't exist. That doesn't mean that we don't honor it or appreciate its beauty, because it does have good qualities. But those good qualities are all temporary, illusory, 
and ultimately unborn and non-existent. This is the message of the Upanishads. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.